junior in high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I liked space, and I liked flying. And so I thought, I want to be an astronaut. And then one day, I went to Columbia University uh, to see an astronomy lecture. And after the lecture, they took us to the roof to use their telescopes. And I had never looked through a telescope before. And when I put my eye onto the eyepiece, this is what I saw. I saw Saturn with my own eyes. And I thought it was so mind-blowing that with my own, my little tiny human I was, I could see something that was three quarters of a billion miles away. And so I decided that I wanted to be an astronomer. So here I am. I've been doing astrophysics research for the past two and a half years at the American Museum of Natural History. And I've been studying uh, low-mass stars called brown dwarfs. This is the Hayden Planetarium where I work. And so for two and a half years, it's been a, such a great pleasure, and I've learned so many things. But I also started to notice some of the issues that are present in the scientific community. And one of them, naturally, was the lack of women in science. And I not only noticed it because I was experiencing it firsthand, but also because it's been an historical problem within this community. So this is a picture of the 1927 Solvay Conference on Quantum Mechanics. And this is some of the most brilliant minds in human history. In fact, 17 out of these 29 people went on to win Nobel Prizes for their accomplishments. And if you like big numbers, I challenge you to calculate the average IQ of this group of people. If you don't like big numbers, you'll find that calculating the ratio between men and women is much easier, as there is only one woman in the picture, and that is Marie Curie. She was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize and the first person to win two Nobel Prizes for her research on radioactivity. And I just wanted to point out the last two people in the middle row all the way on the right are Max Born and Niels Bohr. Uh, and they were two fundamental figures in uh, what is today atomic physics. And then to the left of Marie Curie is uh, Max Planck, which is the developer of quantum mechanics and also a person which a lot of people like to name things after. And in the middle is Albert Einstein, of course, uh, one of the most famous physicists on Earth, and he was the developer of the theory of general relativity. And so because this conference at the time was one of the most important uh, science conferences, the ratio between men and women was very indicative of the gender outlook of the field at the time. And so being a woman in science is something that I noticed right away because I was feeling it on my skin. But I also started to notice something a little bit non-trivial. I was getting this sense that science felt moldy and old, and I couldn't quite pinpoint it for a long time. And then last year, I started researching about the lack of science education in New York City, and I stumbled upon the work of Angela Kelly. She's faculty at Stony Brook. And she outlined three main reasons why there's a lack of science education in New York City. The first one is that there isn't enough competent uh, science teachers. The second one has to do with the regents' exams. And for those of you who aren't from New York City, the regents' exams are required examinations for uh, high school students uh, in order to graduate. And so the problem with the regents is that students tend to score lower on science regents because they're difficult. And so schools, at the end of the year, they get graded by the Department of Education based on a number of factors, and one of them has to do with the scores of their students. And so schools do not want to have their grades lower because of their students not performing so well in the regions, so they give up teaching science altogether. And then the third reason why there's a lack of science education, according to Angela Kelly, is that there isn't enough use of outside resources. And so what are these outside resources? They're grant-funded programs, after-school programs, and summer programs. And these are really interesting because those are the hands-on programs that allow students to really be passionate about science and understand that it's fun and it's not this really detached thing that we have these stereotypes about. And so I started Googling these programs because I wanted to know what do these kids have available if they don't have science in school. And this is what I stumbled upon. It was very old school, very um, dry web pages that had a lot of text and looked very unapproachable. And I thought, why do they have to look so 1990s? Are they all going for a vintage look? Or, and most importantly, why is this wrong and how could we fix it? It seemed to me that science not only needed some really good dusting, uh, it also needed rebranding. And so what is this branding word I'm talking about? So I first heard of branding this past summer. I took um, web design and video game design uh, camp at Parsons. 
And our instructors were telling us that you can make a video game. You can uh, design the most innovative game, uh, game structure ever. And then the moment you start sharing it, for example, on the internet, anybody can download the code, just change the color patterns, put different faces on the characters, and your game is gone. But for example, Mario. Everybody knows Mario, right? It's me, Mario, right? <laughs> and it's because they branded the characters. They crafted very original characters that stood out in the market. And that is really important. Science with these websites does not stand out on the internet. And kids get really bored. We live in an age where we have something that I call visual race. And so companies hire web designers and web developers in order to make websites that are an experience, is interactive, and it's fun, because they want their companies to look fun. And kids spend an average of nine hours a day in front of a screen. They're visually, visually spoiled. We're not entertaining them by having these really dry web pages. Their attention is not caught. And as superficial as it sounds, that's the first thing they see. And they're not going to want to feel, they're going to feel excluded from the scientific community because it's so unapproachable at, on the first look. And so how are we going to rent science? I outlined three main issues that, uh, three main issues that um, need to be fixed and addressed. So the first one is poor design. The current design looks unapproachable, unappealing, and moldy. It's funny, right? <laughs> it's a good word, I like it. Um, and so when the, first, the first thing they see is these really dry, it's, it's sort of to me when I looked at them, I am in the community, so of course I was able to target right away what I was looking for, like the eligibility, the deadlines, the sort of programs, but if these kids come from like non-science field, they come from like their own homes, and they look at these websites, they have no idea what they're, what they're seeing, they're, they have no idea what to look for. And they're naturally prompted to just stay away from science. To me, this is a statement that says, listen, this might not quite be what you're looking for, so just you know, move to other fields. And then the second, the second important thing to fix is what's the point? There's never a stated purpose to why these kids should spend their summer indoors in the first place rather than outside with their friends. The purpose is missing. The strength of science stands in its purpose and applications. Science runs everything. It runs 99% of our everyday lives. It cures diseases. Why are, we not, why are we not emphasizing this? This is really important. This is what science was made for. It's to run our lives, basically, and we're not, the, these websites simply do not emphasize that enough. They just give very practical information. Sometimes I saw that there was a purpose or an attempt and I ran, I stumbled upon this one, uh, this one website that stated, uh, well, how would you like to answer the question, what did you spend your summer doing to your friends? <laughs> this summer, it could be this. And I was thinking, is that really why I want to go do a science program? Because I want to answer a question from my friends? Not because I was researching to find a cure for this particular cancer. Look at this example, for, I mean, Google, everybody loves Google, it's cool. But the thing that I wanted to point you to is that the first thing they have on their homepage for careers is a purpose. Do cool things that matter. As vague as it sounds, it provides a something, a hint of a purpose. My personal favorite example is SpaceX. They state, enabling human life on Mars. Who wouldn't want to spend their summer attempting to enable human life on Mars? And the third problem that is still strong in this community is stereotypes. So there's been large attempts to try and include more women in the science fields. And so I was interested in, in researching uh, specifically programs that were targeting females. And what I was very surprised to find was that there was pink everywhere. And it's 2014. Do we really need pink to attract more girls? I mean, it seems funny to me that we're attempting to attenuate the gender gap by emphasizing gender roles. It's very counterintuitive, right? And finally, I wanted to say that rebranding science and making science cool is not a new concept. In the 80s, Carl Sagan made the series Cosmos, which brought science into living rooms. And of course, Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson make science fun and cool and hands-on. But I also wanted to say on the small scale, I have three awesome research advisors, and two of them started something that's called Astronomy on Tap, which brings science into, brings astronomy specifically into bars. They do talks and they bring their telescopes. And basically they talk to drunk people about science <laughs> so that they make it a little bit more... Um, 
And this is, um, this is Emily Rice, which is one of my advisors. This, she made this costume. It's supposed to be the Hubble Space Telescope. And I just wanted to point out that Neil deGrasse Tyson personally approved this since he works um, on our floor. And she also makes um, astronomy-inspired clothing. And she carries around uh, this little star called the brown dwarf, which is what I study, just to make science a little bit more tangible. And then this is my other advisor, Kelly Cruz, uh, which is a big promoter of uh, increasing the presence, presence of science on the internet. And she started a blog called Astro Better, which um, is a platform for astronomers to share their work and tutorials and useful tools. And they have a Facebook and Twitter. And she makes sure, she makes sure that every conference she goes to, she tells astronomers, it's time to get on the internet, OK? <laughs> and finally, why is this all important? Why do we care that the image of science is rebranded? According to a study done by the New York City Council Committee on Education, 10 years ago, the United States was third behind Finland and Japan in the share of 18 to 24-year-olds getting STEM degrees. So STEM stands for Science, ed Technology, Education, and Mathematics. Today, there are 16 other nations ahead of us. We need to be produ producing 34% more STEM graduates every year in order to compete with the rest of the world. And so we need to rebrand science to make it more interesting, to involve more kids, and to show them how important it is to have a great scientific community and more STEM graduates. So science doesn't need to look like an old black and white picture. <laughs> let's add some color, and let's rebrand science. It's time to diversify it. Thank you.